Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webcast. My name is Christine Dursey Davis. I'm the executive director of the Ohio chapter of APA and chair of the New Urbanism Division, and I'm your webcast moderator. Today, Friday, October 28th, we'll hear the presentation, Modernizing Transportation Agencies. For technical help during today's webcast, you can type your questions in the chat box found in the webcast toolbar to the right of your screen, or you can call the 1-800 number shown in bold. For your content questions related to the presentation, you can type those in the questions box, which is located again in the webinar toolbar to the right of your screen. And we will answer those at the end of the presentation during the Q&A. Coming up on your screen is a list of our sponsoring chapters and divisions for 2016. Thanks to all those participating sponsors for making these webcasts possible and free to their members. Today, in particular, we are sponsored by the Transportation Planning Division. To learn more about this division, you can visit planning.org slash divisions slash transportation. Okay, up on your screen now is a list of our upcoming webcasts. You can register for these by, by visiting our webcast webpage at ohioplanning.org slash planningwebcast. And to log your CM credits for attending today's webcast, you can uh, visit planning.org, log into your MyAPA account, and then search for your activity via either the event number or the title of today's webcast both of which can be found on our webcast webpage, ohioplanning.org slash planningwebcast. And this uh, webcast has been approved for 1.5 CM credits for live viewing only. Some recorded webcasts are available for distance education, and you can check out the availability of those on our webcast webpage, ohioplanning.org slash planningwebcast. And like us on Facebook, planning webcast series to receive up-to-date information on our upcoming sessions. If you saw a few slides back, we have a, a few placeholders for some upcoming webcasts, and we will be sure to post those on our uh, Facebook page when they are ready to go. We are recording today's webcast, and it will be available on our YouTube channel after the session ends. Just head over to YouTube dot com slash planning webcast and a PDF will be available after the webcast ends again on our webcast webpage ohioplanning.org slash planning webcast. All right, I am now going to kick it over to today's speaker, Beth Osborne, who will uh, get us started here. Beth, it's all you. All right, let me put this in the presentation mode. Uh, first off, hey everybody, thanks for joining on a Friday afternoon. I really appreciate your, uh, you know, being the sort of transportation geek that I am and willing to talk about these issues all the way up until it is, uh, you know, time to end the week. Um, so I'm going to talk about some of the work that we are currently doing with transportation agencies uh, ar around the country, particularly the work we're doing with state DOTs. And before I really get started, I wanted to say a little bit about um, our organization. So Transportation for America uh, is generally known for the work we do at the federal level, promoting transportation choices, but also in um, promoting more uh, transportation decision making down at the local and regional level. And there's a very good reason why we focus the local level. It's at the local level that people do most of their traveling. It's at the local level where we are most able to coordinate transportation investments between various sectors, such as you know, housing and land use and uh, stormwater and all the other ways we invest. It's also uh, where a lot of the greatest frustrations in transportation lie uh, when it comes to uh, problems with uh, 
state of repair or congestion or lack of access to jobs. It, people are normally thinking about local travel, and yet the majority of our federal program focuses at the state level, which is not where most people uh, think about their transportation needs, and they rarely travel at state level uh, on a regular basis. Um, we also are, uh, we're a subsidiary, let's say, a, a part of an organization known as Smart Growth America that many of you are familiar with and have worked with in the past. So a lot of times the work I do is through Smart Growth America, not Transportation for America, but I am housed in Transportation for America. Um, we are known for a handful of reports. We just recently published a report that is a guide to the most recent transportation reauthorization bill known as the FAST Act. Um, we uh, are also known for following uh, local transportation funding and policy initiatives and statewide funding and policy initiatives. And in fact, we're going to be having a, a meeting to talk about what's happening, particularly at the state level, in terms of raising funding for transportation and policy changes often only taken on because there's a need for funding. And this is really being focused at the state level because people have finally come to realize that the federal government is not going to be doing a lot in this area. And there's more information on that on our website. After the election, we'll have a rundown of all the various initiatives and how they did uh, um, in the election. Um, we also have been following very closely in performance measures and how they're being employed in the transportation field and particularly uh, the state of our nation's bridges and pointing out when money is not being spent to deal with the urgent problems, state of repair issues. But a lot of the work I'm going to talk about today comes from a, a report, a, a couple of reports that we've done. I'm going to go through. One is uh, repair priorities, which we talked about how many states are still building brand new infrastructure while their infrastructure is falling apart. Um, Dangerous by Design that many of you all probably know about that talks about how not only are the roadways dangerous for people outside of their car, but they are designed in a way that is particularly good at creating danger for people who are traveling outside of their car. And in doing this, we've gotten some states' attention and uh, are now working with them to fix the problem. One of the things that I think is most unfortunate about this issue is it has taken decades to create the problem. And even the states that are working really hard to fix it are a decade or more away from really seeing uh, a turnaround because it's, it, it is such a slow um, and, and difficult uh, ship to steer. And it's been going in the direction it's been going for a very long time. Uh, I also wanted to point out a report that I'm particularly proud of that we worked on uh, talking with businesses and about where they're moving. Um, and, and I can tell you they're moving to places that are more walkable, which means they're safer for people who are walking and taking transit and uh, biking. And that's gotten a lot of states' attention, is they are hearing now regularly from the business sector that the things that you used to do for business, which was give them a connection to a highway, is not helping them attract talent anymore. I was just in uh, Massachusetts, and the Secretary of Transportation for Massachusetts was saying that they've got a company just outside of Boston that has a great connection to their interstate, and the company has come to them saying, this doesn't, this doesn't help me at all. We can't get any of our employees here particularly the young and talented ones, don't want to drive out here. A lot of them don't have cars. I need a transit connection. So all the things that they have done over the last 40 years, 50 years, 60 years, to connect businesses to the economy through roads are not really working in today's economy. And so this is another area that's really getting states' attention. So a little bit about me. Um, I am Transportation for America's Vice President for Technical Assistance. And uh, I am particularly trying to steer our work away from the federal government and more into where most of transportation decision making occurs, which is the state level. We certainly work with locals so they understand how to utilize the program, 
but since Congress and, uh, and everyone has determined that the federal program will go entirely through the states, I am focused at that level to see a shift in the way projects are designed and funding is focused. And I get to, because I'm at a, a mission-based 501c3, I get to work with people who already agree with me on this. And, and the good news is today, there are a lot of state DOTs that recognize the problem and they're looking for help. Um, before coming to Transportation for America, I was the Acting Assistant Secretary for Transportation Policy at the U.S. Department of Transportation, and before that, Deputy Assistant Secretary. And in that capacity, I ran a, a program that a lot of people know about. It was uh, the most popular program ever created at U.S. DOT, the Tiger Discretionary Grant Program. Very popular program because locals actually have access to it and because it is the single most flexible program at the entire department. It not only allows spending in any area, it makes it easy to do all kinds of different kinds of modal work in the same project. Uh, it really allows areas to innovate. Uh, we also uh, managed all policy that came to the department, any legislation passed uh, during our time there. And before that, I was on Capitol Hill. Um, also working for members that worry a lot about these uh, transportation issues and whether or not we're spending our dollars well. Um, recently I put out a report. Um, I only point to this. Uh, it actually is a little more negative than I'm going to be today and it's talking about things that aren't working in our transportation program. Um, however, it also has a bunch of examples of states that are doing really great things outside of what I'm going to discuss today. What I'm talking about today is going to be mostly about states that are reworking the way they develop projects so that they can be a uh, smaller scale so money can go further and so they can be more multimodal and safe to all users. Um, in the new principles for our transportation program we get into really stellar examples of performance management and some other areas that uh, might be of interest to folks on the phone and especially as the federal rules on performance management are coming down and are likely to be final in January and all of our state transportation agencies and uh, metropolitan planning organizations will have to set targets for meeting certain areas of performance. It's an area you all might want to know about because those targets will then be used to justify every decision of spending made for the next four or five years. Um, one of the things that comes up over and over again is this issue, particularly transportation and land use, a complete lack of coordination. And the biggest part of the conversation I have with states, and I always start with this slide, is you can pretend like your roads have nothing to do with transportation, or have nothing to do with land use, and land use has nothing to do with transportation. But I give you this. I give you this example of two basically next door neighbors that because of a poorly thought out road network, and poorly designed planning um, are, and this is in Florida, have to go miles, I believe it's almost seven miles, to get door to door. There's no way to bushwhack through from these two houses. And one of the reasons this is a really important message for the states is when you, you point out to them that you are, they are set up to fail by bad development decisions, and then you show them where transportation decisions actually force some of these bad development decisions, they engage in a different way. But it, it always takes showing them the absurdity and saying as long as development like this is going on and these people expect to be able to get to each other's houses, how are you ever going to you know, pay your way through the problem? So um, we, we talk about uh, a lot of transportation and land use coordination in this report, but also in our technical assistance. We started a few years ago in coordination with the State Smart Transportation Initiative in looking at really innovative practices that are going on at the state DOT level. And there's a lot of very interesting things going on um, across the country. We look at several different areas, but one of the areas we really focused in on was in that multimodal planning side of things. Um, another one of our sister agencies is the National Complete Streets Coalition. We had gone around the country convincing people to adopt complete streets policies, and a bunch of states have done so as well. And one of them in particular, the state of Michigan, came to us and said, you know, we've adopted this complete streets policy. We, we really do want to see that outcome 
in our work more often, but you know, in spite of the policy being on the books, we're not actually seeing any of our projects change shape at all. And we don't understand why that is. And so we worked with the state of Michigan and we slowly worked through uh, what, was, what was going on. And we developed a curriculum um, that we have also done in Vermont and Florida. And we're going to be doing in a few other states. The, for these three states, it was very much focused on the complete streets implementation issue. Um, and all of them recognized that they, they had design standard issues. The way they had set out rules for how you build roads were creating a problem in terms of pedestrian, bicyclist, transit safety. We actually backed up from that and, and developed a curriculum that looked more broadly at all of the issues they have to address or all the different users of the system and what, uh, what considerations they need for them and then how to put that together. So our Complete Streets implementation starts from the prospect that most of the transportation programs were created to move cars. And as a result, over the decades, there have been a series of rules and decisions made with, frankly, I would say unintended consequences on non-drivers, but it really goes beyond that. Those other uh, travelers were not considered travelers. They, it was just not the interest. It was not within the purview of most of the departments, which were called departments of highways, and some still are, uh, to, to think about moving those people. So, as a result, we've accreted this huge list of design standards, rules, but, but really beyond that, uh, more perceived uh, barriers, even if they aren't written in stone, um, like culture and who is considered to be successful at their job and who moves up the ladder faster, um, those sorts of barriers to creating a system that would feel you know, safe and welcoming and open to people outside of the car. So we developed a suite of workshops that were done over several days um, and actually in different chunks at the time. We don't do it that way anymore. Um, we started out with not just a discussion of the impact of land use on transportation and transportation on land use, but about the economics behind a different type of land use. What's happening in the economy what's happening uh, in terms of uh, property values in areas that are well served by transit, that are walkable with the National Association of Realtors, even promoting their properties by walk score, talking about millennials, talking about core values report, talking about retirees and people living 11 years past their driving age, um, all kinds of, of issues that were happening, happening, and the one that particularly sticks out when we talk to the state DOTs is how few homes currently have um, children in them and how that number is getting smaller. And that seems to really stick out as something that requires an adjustment um, since so much of our rules and programs have grown up around taking care of families with kids because they used to be the majority of the population. So when we talk about the economics of various land use decisions and then talk about transportation and land use, the conversation becomes more, more about how the transportation system needs to support a different type of land use because that's what the market is calling for. And that becomes a more powerful discussion. We also talked about technology and how it can support different types of uh, users and also dealing with the conflict between different users, particularly intelligent transportation systems how to use transportation demand management effectively. States often don't have TDM programs of any size, and when they do, they aren't terribly robust. Um, we went through what is required to take care of the, all, the, the different users of the roadway system, whether they be transit, bicyclists, um, pedestrians, or freight. And when we talk particularly about transit users, we're also talking about what the transit operators need to think about when they are operating on the streets and how, how do you design a roadway for transit. We have created programs 
that look at transit as if it is a separate mode from highways. And often rail transit is on a completely different uh, right-of-way, but buses aren't, streetcars aren't, and the overwhelming majority of transit is on the roadway, and yet we have roadway designers that have no idea how to design a road for transit, much less for the user of transit trying to access it. And so we go through that and introduce them to that so they can even figure out what, what they need to consider. Same thing with bicyclists and pedestrians. Even when you get folks that kind of recognize that we need infrastructure for bicyclists and pedestrians, there is this notion that um, if the infrastructure is there, that that is a bicycle and pedestrian friendly environment. And uh, this is where you revisit a lot of the land use side and what makes an environment friendly to them, what tends to bring bicyclists and pedestrians out. And particularly when we work with Florida, the Florida State DOT has used this as a way to really bring their locals into the conversation and say, we're willing to spend money in your community to rebuild this roadway and make it a complete street, but only for the communities that are going to make the land use changes necessary to support it. And so there's a uh, a, a more uh, more synergy of, amongst the, the two sides, the transportation planners and the land use planners, to figure out how to do both together. We also talk about freight movements. What we find at state DOTs is a lot of times when they're talking about freight, they're really just talking about semis. So in their mind, if they've made a lane wide enough for semi-trucking, given uh, roadways that have, or uh, corners that have very wide turn radii, then, you know, you can close up shop and go home. You've taken care of trucks. And there, this is a part where we talk more about what the freight industry does. What do freight logistics people do? How many different ways do they even move freight? How do they view the trans transportation system? The fact that they, they will change their approach through logistics hundreds of times before any particular project is built that one of their biggest challenges has to do with smaller delivery vehicles and where to park them to make delivery because the roads are not built to accommodate the actual delivery. The roads are built with the idea that you're always moving through and that the freight deliverer never actually has to arrive any place and make the delivery. And this is a very interesting conversation to have with the state DOTs to think about the different types of trucks they're moving, um, and ha therefore what that means for the design of that roadway. And in some case now, delivery is being made even by bicycle and things like that. We talk about uh, integrating the needs of all modes. And this last one, we spend a great deal of time on, about a whole day, discussing why you can't do all the wonderful things we just train people on. And this is really the, the point of the workshop, is to figure out what it is that's standing in their way. Um, so we then, from that, develop an implementation plan. Um, and if you look online, you can see the reports we've done for, for all three states we've worked with so far. And when we're, we're in the midst of uh, a, a training with California, um, we, we did some work with local governments in Central Florida. We'll be doing some training with the state of Hawaii. And we'll also be moving into the state of Washington and Colorado soon. Um, and then Oregon, so we have, we have a long list of these sorts of reports coming out. But you'll see an evolution in the ones that we've worked on so far. The Michigan report is very much focused on design standards. Um, in particular, it, not just design standards for the roadways, but the procedure by which you develop a project. By the time we get to the Florida one, it's much more about the culture and the way the, uh, the DOT works with the community around it. Now, we still have all the stuff about design in there, but it's one chapter in a series of chapters as opposed to simply looking at just designs. Um, so uh, what we find in every place are the typical issues that we see um, you know, wherever you go. We see uh, areas that have no uh, design standards at all for bicyclists or pedestrians, and so there's simply no infrastructure. We see that where they are, there are designs, they're not completely carried out, they're not fully thoughtful about what makes a friendly environment for a pedestrian. You know, we, we talk about what if the road ended like that, how many people do you think would drive through your community? 
Um, we also talk about uh, design issues like when you're trying to design for that big truck that might be delivering or so that cars don't have to slow down as they take a right-hand turn, what sort of environment are you creating for the person that is trying to get across the crosswalk in the middle of the lane where cars are not supposed to slow down? Or the, the picture on the left, which is in Florida, and you see this all over Florida, that road is probably marked 45 miles per hour, but it is designed for, uh, for 60, and that's what the cars are going. And even when you're in a car, when a car passes you by, so if you're waiting at the left-hand turn signal or something, and a car passes you by, it shakes your car. And you can imagine being on that itty-bitty little bike lane to the right of cars that are flying by so quickly that they make your car shake what they do to you on your bike. And so you know, there's just the basic notion that the way we design for other users is uh, we, we give them as little as is humanly possible. But it goes beyond that. Um, we design wide, wide lanes. We design for uh, the way we handle design speed. We design over the speed we want people to drive. So we talk through all of those issues that uh, you find in the Green Book. And I think these are the issues we expect to be raised when you walk into a state and you say, what are the barriers to building a multimodal street? Um, you expect them to say, oh, well, the barriers are we don't put anything into accommodating bicyclists, pedestrians, and transit users, and the way we design our street is for wide roads and fast-moving cars. And that is all true. And we go through in great detail all the places in the design guides that uh, it makes it very difficult to address the needs of other users. But there's a ton else that needs uh, addressing, and it wouldn't if the designs were fixed, it wouldn't be enough. Um, one of the biggest problems we find is that the public is not engaged until after design is well underway. And as a result, what the DOT sets themselves up in a relationship with the public where you know, they have an idea of what they want to do, and now they're looking to buy off objection. And you're never, you never get the sort of real input or positive feeling you need when you do that. And the state of Washington has even started to measure how much it costs them to operate that way, that it actually results in more expensive projects than if you just go in at the beginning and get an idea of what people see as their challenges in that area and design for that immediately. Another big area we're finding is there are no approved alternative designs available to the engineers. So they open up their design guides and it tells them, for the most part, to build wide roads and, and build safely for fast moving vehicles. And if they wanted to design something else, the procedure that they have to go through is basically make it up and good luck to you. And that is a completely ridiculous position to put an engineer into. They don't want flexibility. They will tell you this. They want to know what has been tried and what works, and then to employ what they know works. And so giving them alternative designs is a much more effective way to address um, the needs of all users than simply saying, well, you can do something different. Just make it up. And oh, by the way, if you get sued, good luck. It doesn't really instill a great deal of confidence on their side. Um, a lot of times when they make up their own process, it requires a huge amount of waivers. And what we are told repeatedly is leadership will say, well, they can use the waiver process. And then you're told by the, the people who are doing the actual designing that waivers are not granted in their state. There's a culture against it. It never happens. And so, yes, in theory, you can get waivers, but they they're not real. Um, and all of this wraps into the issue that engineers are rated on how quickly they deliver a project. So they're given two options. One is use the design you're already familiar with that's written in the book and requires no waivers, or design something from scratch, get waivers, and then when you don't deliver it at the same lightning speed as the plug and play version, then you will be held responsible for not doing your job properly. So a lot of the way jobs are reviewed and people are rated go against the notion of make it up and innovate because 
innovating and creating your own design takes significantly more time. And so some of this, it needs to be either, like I said, giving them alternative designs that they can plug and play just as easily, or not rating engineers on how quickly they deliver a project, but maybe on how pleased people are with the project when it's done, or, um, or, or in coming up with new designs that are popular, or something like that. Um, but right now, there's strong cultural pressure on engineers to, to build quickly. And uh, a lot of what we're pushing for in complete streets requires them to get bad ratings. Um, on performance measures, there are a lot of performance measures used at state DOTs currently. They just don't value the things we're talking about. And as I mentioned earlier, there's going to be federal rules coming down the pike in January that, depending on how good a job DOT does, um, could push them in a different direction to some extent. Um, but a lot of it's just buried in the system, like the, the use of what we call a design standard of you know, level of service. Um, that is all about autos, and it's making sure that they never slow down at any point of the day. And as long as those measures are buried in various places, it's, it's extremely hard to change the way you design a roadway. Um, yet another issue is the fact that we require 20-year traffic projections to base designs on. Um, we have a lot of, in, of materials that help to create these 20-year traffic projections, and they can get quite precise. Sometimes you'll see these numbers of uh, predictions that go down to two, you know, two and three digits past the decimal point. They're extremely precise, and they are extremely uh, inaccurate, and in many cases, completely useless. And the notion originally was, if we're going to build a project that's going to have 20 years of life, when the 20 years have passed, we, we don't want to get five years into the life of the project and have it be obsolete. That is a waste of money. But we're now doing the exact opposite. Where we're building towards these projections that are ridiculous. And so we're throwing money at something that, that never comes to be. And then we don't have enough money to go around. So addressing ways to, to fix that. And, and then the last area, which I'm going to cover, because we've really started to focus in this area, is just the basic scoping process for how we build um, transportation projects. A lot of times, the way projects are scoped is based on state of repair needs. So the pavement condition on the stretch of roadway has gotten uh, to a, a bad place, and so we need to resurface. And that's what we do. So the engineer comes in, and they scope the project for resurfacing, and then um, uh, they design it, and they set the budget, and then they deliver it to the public. Well. We haven't visited yet whether or not there's good enough accessibility for bicyclists and pedestrians, whether there's some safety problems, whether there's a development coming in that's going to take an area that hasn't seen a lot of bicyclists and pedestrians and put a ton of them on that area. Um, none of those have been considered, and now they're all budget busters because now the budget and the scope has been set and everything is additional. And so the whole weight of the, the, the project delivery process is against you. So looking for ways to have these discussions before scoping takes place, especially in states that are primarily focused on state of repair, becomes a big challenge. And the last area is scope being based on a potential solution, not a problem. And in this area, this is, this is a new area that's a big focus for us and for federal highways in several states. So uh, my new colleague, Lynn Peterson, the former uh, uh, head of Washington State, Department of Transportation joined us uh, in the spring, and her big focus is uh, something that is known as practical design. It is the notion of better defining the transportation problem so that we don't come up with very expen unnecessarily expensive and over-engineered solutions to the problem. Um, the Federal Highway Administration is focusing on this too. They have recognized, and this started back when I was at USDOT, in fact, um, some very kind people at Federal Highways uh, a couple weeks ago said that this all came out of my complaining to them when I was in the office of the secretary, that um, when someone suggests a problem, that the way the process uh, is currently set up, 
that we generate the most expensive solution to it in every case. And they started to dig into it and realize that was more true than they wanted it to be. And so they've started reviewing their own procedures and looking at where they push for more expensive uh, solutions than might be necessary. And so they're trying to remove some of the barriers they recognize are at the federal level, but they're also looking to teach states how to come up with more practical solutions and more uh, low-cost solutions to various transportation problems. We worked particularly with the Tennessee DOT, and our report from our work with them is also online. Tennessee uh, had a, a backlog of about $8 billion, and this is a state that, you know, their annual program is closer, you know, to the, the 400,000 uh, sorry, $400 million mark from the feds and then probably matched by state dollars. So it's, you know, under a billion dollars and they have an $8 billion backlog. And what they realized was um, a lot of their projects that had uh, built up on their wish list, um, which is unfortunately what a lot of the, the um, state transportation improvement programs have become, wish lists, um, had built up because the, the way they come to the state DOT is someone walks in and says, you know, I need a bypass. And everyone says, okay, you need a bypass, so let's start designing it. And Well, with 20-year traffic projections and, you know, this bypass is going to go over a wetland, so it needs to be bridged, and, you know, you start getting to work on it, and before you know it, you have a $40 million solution. But nobody ever says, why do you think you need a bypass? And that's what the, the Commissioner of Transportation in Tennessee said. Don't bring me your solutions, bring me your problems. My problem is I have a breakdown of traffic in this area and I want to address it. And then they start asking, well, why do you have a breakdown in transportation in that area? Maybe it's because that's where everybody's going. And one of the reasons a bypass isn't a good idea is because that's their destination. You can't bypass someone's destination. Or maybe it's because you've got a major employer and you don't have another way for them to access that employer and creating a second entrance to a facility could do more good. And so what Tennessee started doing is looking at the projects that had been on their list for a long time and had gone nowhere and putting a finer point on what was the problem they were trying to solve. And if you go uh, and look up there, they call it expedited project delivery process. They have a whole bunch of examples. But it's ex you know, just simple examples like, like this one, which was you know, a, a two-lane uh, rural road. And you know, it goes through areas that might have uh, some mountains and things like that that mean that the road is a little too windy. And, uh, and Again, they develop an extremely expensive solution. In this case, it was $58 million, mostly because they were expanding it and adding shoulders. And in doing so, they had to blow up some mountain to do it and straighten the road. And instead, they said, OK, well, we are trying to improve safety here. So where are the unsafe points uh, along the way? And uh, what, what other treatments can we use? And in some cases, they said, well, we really only need to add a third lane on this small stretch of road so that people can turn or they can pass in this area. We don't need to go to four lanes all the way through. We might be able to add a guardrail here. There are all kinds of other things that we can put together. And they came up with, instead of a $58 million project, an $85,000 project. Because as it turned out on this road, really all they needed was guardrails and warnings and, and adjustments to speed limits and things like that. And they actually got uh, equally good safety results as blowing the whole thing open. Um, so you can, you can see uh, they, they looked at what was the crash rate. They got a sense of where the crashes were taking place. And they have a projected savings on the project of $57,915,000. And they go back to the project sponsor and they say, look, for $58 million, we will get to the project eventually. It will just be in 25 years. So I could either put your big project on for you know, uh, sometime in around 2040, or I can put your $85,000 project on the list for next year. 
and I, I leave it to you. And it turns out most people want something done right now. And so they've been able to review a whole bunch of projects and find much cheaper ways to do it. Um, this sort of approach has led us to change our approach to the training we do. And we start right off now talking about practical design and least cost planning. And both of these are, particularly the practical design, it comes down to coming up with the exact right definition of the problem you're trying to solve and being as, uh, as clear as possible about what is the, the very specific issue and then looking at every possible solution. And when you define projects specifically, rather than the way we typically do, which is, I need traffic to move faster. That's not, that's not a problem. Uh, a problem is traffic isn't moving quickly because, and what's typically been the case is people say, because the road isn't wide enough. But through practical design, you learn how to put a finer point on that. You know, where are people coming from? What, where are they going? And looking at all the different solutions and looking for lower cost solutions like operational solutions. In my own backyard, we have a roadway that moves quite slowly. And the reason it moves slowly is there's a light at the end of my block, in spite of the fact that there's no cross street at the end of my block. There once was, but it was closed down, and they never took the light away. Um, I have it on good authority that my uh, DOT was looking at expanding the roadway because of the traffic. And it never occurred to anybody that they could just take up the light that doesn't serve any traffic except to hold it up and save themselves money. And through uh, getting engineers to better define these problems and look at true causes of backups and issues that they face, um, we help them figure out ways to design much cheaper projects and look to solve the problem that exists today instead of worrying so much about the problem that might exist if we could read um, you know, the tea leaves in 20 years. And then we still talk about land use and transportation and the transit user and the bicyclist and the pedestrian and freight needs. And in, uh, in integrating the needs of all the modes, we also have a part on public involvement. And this is really coming from Lynn, who found that quite literally millions are saved by involving the public earlier and then identifying the standards. And like I said, we asked the engineers to go through for us OK, you just heard all these ideas. Why can't you do these great ideas? And they, will, they come up with some really interesting issues, some of which are clearly written in the, their many manuals and guides, and some of which aren't written, but everyone knows them to be true. And figuring out how to address those can sometimes be the most difficult. So as I said, um, you know, this is something we have done in three states, uh, Michigan, Vermont, and Florida. Florida is the one that is most aggressively working through the implementation plan. They're completely rewriting their design guides, their scoping procedures, the way they deal with the public. They're um, adding new performance measures to their system. They're changing the way they evaluate the, um, the work of their engineers. They're, they are doing training that's not only for their internal folks, but also for public works uh, staff at the local level. Um, and, and with all of this amazing work that they are doing, it'll still be, I mean, it will be until a year from now before their design guide is done. And then they'll have to train everybody on their design guide. And then they'll have to start developing projects under their new design guide. And then those projects will have to be built. And then they'll have to be built in a big enough number to really change the built environment. So you can see that these are procedures that take a very, very long commitment to get it done. Um, Michigan is also really, uh, kicking into gear and getting through some of their self-identified challenges. Um, we will be doing training with Caltrans uh, in the middle of next month, uh, Hawaii in December, and next year, like I said, on to a handful of other states like Washington, Oregon, and Colorado. Um, we are very interested in working with other localities and uh, states that are interested. Um, it, we really are uh, focusing on those that, are, that already recognize they have a problem and are interested in fixing it. Um, this is something that's a pretty big commitment and, and hard work. And so it only works with someone who really wants to do it. So uh, that's my, my rundown. I will say I'm really excited about what's being accomplished. And while it's going to be a while before we can really see 
the impact on the built environment uh, and, and real changes in communities. It is very exciting to see so many state DOTs fully recognize that they have a problem that needs to be fixed. The list I gave you is nowhere near complete in terms of those that, want, that are interested in starting to talk to us. I mean, in Utah and Massachusetts and Tennessee again. I mean, we just, there are a whole bunch of states that realize the way we've been doing things is out of date. They're hearing from their local governments that, um, they, that they need a different product for the economy. They're hearing from their employers that they need a different product and that uh, the state DOT's old version of how you address transportation is simply out of date. And, uh, and there is interest in making change. And so the extent to which we can get in with them and roll up our sleeves and help them figure out some of these arcane rules and procedures and cultures that get in the way of doing it, uh, it's, a, it's a really exciting process and you know, something that I hope in another 10 years, we can say we've worked ourselves out of a job because every state's doing it. And from there, I'd love to throw it open to questions. Okay, great. Um, folks, again, you can ask questions by typing them into the questions box in your GoToWebinar toolbar. Um, okay, under practical design for a roadway resurfacing project, how would one justify expanding the system for bike, ped, and transit improvements? Yeah, I, I, yeah, I think it, yeah, that, right. that, that is very much the way a lot of people look at the issue, which is um, we have a basic roadway system, and now it needs to be expanded for bike, ped. And we take a totally different approach, which is there is no such thing as a local road that does not accommodate all users. We would never say, how do you expand a roadway to accommodate a car? That would sound like a strange thing to say. And it's only spoken of the way we typically do because we otherize the bicyclist and the pedestrian. In many cases, what folks are doing, if, if they take a practical design approach and recognize things like, I don't have to build my road for fear, big enough for, uh, out of, I don't have to build my road hugely because I'm fearful that one day I will have twice as many cars on the road, when that pressure comes off, you can start allocating the right-of-way slightly differently. You can say, well, what do I want this area to be? This area is supposed to be a slower moving, uh, more Main Street anyway, so um, I can take the same right-of-way, the exact same facility, and just allocate the, the right-of-way to different users in different ways, and I can do that for the same cost. It's only more because what we're doing is we're designing it with one user in mind and then going to the public and saying, what did we leave out? And then what, what they left out, which they should have known for the start was left out, is considered an added cost. So we're really going at the notion of getting it into the original scope and making it integral to the original um, approach. And also avoiding the over-engineered solution for cars that, that push bicyclists and pedestrians out or require majorly expanded rights of way to address them. A lot of times we are, we are wasting our, our right of way now on wide lanes on streets that are supposed to accommodate slower traffic. I can't tell you how many times I see streets that are marked 25 miles per hour with 12 foot lanes. That's insanity. You, you have a 12 foot lane and people are going to go you know, 35, 40 miles per hour on it. So take those two feet from each of four lanes, and that's a lot of space you have to work with. And so it's really a, a whole rethinking of it, rather than building everything for cars and then saying, where's our pot of money to come in and stick this other stuff on? OK. Um, could you give some examples of the reasons why some engineers um, might say that they cannot implement complete streets or ideas that are coming from the public and how to go about yes. um, changing their mind? So this is such a great question and I don't think we get any other question as often as this one and it, it there is there's just a huge number of reasons and figuring out which reason is behind the bad decision <laughs> by the engineer is half the battle. Um, Sometimes they feel like they can't implement it uh, because 
they don't have support for whatever reason from above. And maybe it is that their leadership thinks that, you know, bike ped is a, a waste of time. And that is a hard thing to overcome. And normally you only overcome that with political pressure. Uh, sometimes it is because they don't know any other way. They're not familiar with any other design. And a lot of engineers, like I said, engineers are not thrilled with the notion of flexibility. And I, uh, it is so typical that I am told by federal highways or departments of transportation that, oh, you know, if you don't like this design, we can make up a new design. But that's not how engineers think. They don't think, oh, I have this perfectly tested, proven, and um, and well-established design guide full of specific layouts for roads and cross-sections and rules, but I should abandon that, make it up from scratch, and see how it goes. That's not, that's not normal for anybody, really, is to say, I'm just going to throw everything open and, and build it from scratch. And it's not just because they're afraid that they'll get sued, but a lot of times you'll hear that from them. Sometimes it is because taking the time to come up with a whole a new approach means they have to go through a waiver. And that waiver, they know, they know absolutely well what is going to happen when they go to the person who's in charge of giving them that waiver. They are going to be told no. So as far as they're concerned, they can't do it. They're right. I'm going to go ask for a waiver to do what you just asked me to do, and they're going to tell me no. And that can be a challenge from uh, the, the outside community's perspective is, how do you overcome the fact that theoretically there is an exit from the current design and in reality it never gets used? And unfortunately that is only overcome really by political pressure, which is not how we want that system to work, but that's how it works today. Um, I, I think in many cases having alternative guides in place so that uh, an engineer is not held responsible for taking a long time making up a new approach and going through these waiver processes is really important. So especially if you know of a handful of cities that have sought the exact same type of design and been held up, pushing the, the DOT to look at, at addressing whatever it is, that similar thing that you need in all places as a you know, a, a new design that's approved so, so that engineers can, like I said, plug and play, just like they do with their typical designing process, is a good way to go. Um, and pointing out to them, you know, looking at your neighboring communities and bringing all of those examples together to your DOT and saying, you know, look, I have 20 projects where we're trying to do this, and in each one you're trying to treat it like a one-off can't we come up with a programmatic solution so that every time somebody brings you this issue, you actually know how to deal with it. Um, I will say another uh, area of concern comes from the fact that uh, a lot of times the states just they don't want to try something new. They're comfortable in what they do. They know it. And they use federal rules or state rules or whatever it is um, as an excuse to not try something new. And one of the best things to do there is to get real detailed real fast <laughs> about which rule they're relying on. A lot of times they blame the feds. Frankly, the federal process is rarely the problem. Um, the states love to blame the feds because then you, you go yell at someone other than them. But uh, most of the federal program is designed to support the states in doing whatever the heck they want to do. And if you get told that the feds don't let you do it, then get someone from the federal side on the phone and make them show you where it's written. Um, sometimes you'll get there, but a lot of times it's not written anywhere. What you find out is, no, it's a state rule, and it's more of a guideline than a rule. And, uh, and kind of forcing them to show you where it is is a good step because then it can tell you where, which, uh, which part of this kind of amoeba you need to, to put pressure on um, rather than everyone pointing at everybody else. But it can be very complicated and a lot of times, uh, especially these days because this is the other way of doing things, you really need, uh, you need to squeak and scream and drive them nuts until, um, until they give you what, 
what you want. Once you have good examples, though, it gets significantly easier. Because it's amazing how effective it is to say, why did you let them do it and you won't let me do it? So I think the big fight is for the first time you want to do something interesting. And from then on, it turns into how come you like your other child more than me <laughs> sort of approach. I want the same thing they have. And, and that starts working. OK. Let's talk about MPOs. How uh, we, we have several questions about this. So um, how are they leading the charge? How, what should they be doing to add to the conversation of, of changing the mindsets of, of, of those naysayers? Um, let's start there. Okay. Um, my answer, uh, as uh, any good staffer from Washington, D.C. knows to do, is uh, it depends, um, which I know that sounds squirrely, but it really does depend. Different MPOs have different capacity. They have different stature in the region, and it really depends on which MPO you're talking about. Uh, the Orlando area MPO is acting as very much a, a leader in this in that uh, they support training for their local governments and their, um, their uh, uh, public works agencies. They uh, uh, try to bring folks together to share best practices. Um, and, and so we do see that where uh, MPOs are helping communities to figure out how to make an adjustment here. They get into discussions, especially I think when they're COGS, uh, they're more effective at talking about other issues than transportation, such as land use. Um, and they can do that, like I said, by sharing of best practices, by training of staff, by helping them work with their state DOT. Um, some of them are looking at measuring uh, performance in a multimodal way, the extent to which they adopt performance measures that force a multimodal lens will kind of help push the dialogue along. Um, but especially in areas, you know, look, some states have the problem and the luxury of all roads being owned by, you know, one party. In Virginia, Virginia owns every road, alley, at bridge, everything in the state. Um, in a lot of ways, that makes things easier. In Florida, every, it's a patchwork. And from the, the driver's perspective or the traveler's perspective, you don't know who, whose road you're on. You just want it to work. From the transportation design perspective, it creates a mess. So if you're you know, Winter Park, Florida, and you're trying to design all of your roads to be more accessible to people outside of a car, but you only own every third road, and the county owns some, and the state owns some, and they're not going in the same direction, that it, it creates for a mess because you need a network of these roads in order for anyone to really be able to walk through your community. So the MPO in that situation plays an extremely important coordination role in getting all of those folks on the same page and helping to design these things from the perspective of the traveler and not from the perspective of the jurisdiction who happens to own that stretch of pavement. Um, so yeah, we do see some really good leadership in certain MPOs and in other MPOs, they're maybe not staffed for it uh, or it, you know, it's not something they see in their purview. So um, it's worth looking into. There's a bunch of them certainly in Ohio. Uh, I've worked a lot with the Cleveland MPO and I think they're uh, really trying to look at ways to measure performance in a multimodal way. That's very exciting. Um, so where you find that kind of leadership, uh, dig in and help uh, to cultivate it. Okay. Um, let's switch gears and talk a little bit about this 20-year planning horizon. There's a lot of questions about that. Um, federal government requires 20-year planning horizon and metropolitan transportation plans. What alternatives to this usual 20-year traffic modeling do you suggest? Like on the five-year, the 10-year? Um, could you dig a little deeper into that? Yeah, and there's 20-year tw there's planning horizons, and then there's the 20-year design horizon. That's a different thing. It's one thing to do long-range plans over 20 years and try to figure out what's going to be happening in your region and 
think about what that means for transportation needs and demands and things like that. Asset management requires uh, you know, planning out into the future. That's different than saying, uh, when I model travel demand, in particular, particularly traffic, um, what will traffic be on this stretch of road in 20 years? Because whatever answer you come up with, I, the one thing I know is it's wrong. Um, I mean, I guess maybe a stop clock style, you might accidentally be right sometimes. Um, so what we're trying to do is help states to distinguish between what they know for sure and tackle that solution rather than what they are sort of kind of projecting but they really have no way of knowing. And uh, a lot of folks are finding that you know you can be reasonably confident of what's going to happen in the next five years. Ten years is getting tough. I mean, my neighborhood looked nothing like it does now ten years ago. Um, Twenty years ago, <laughs> you wouldn't you wouldn't be able to get your bearings in my neighborhood 20 years ago from what it looks now. And uh, the, the, the transportation issues they were projecting 20 years ago were wrong. All the things that they thought they'd have to do in this neighborhood are completely, um, they just have nothing to do with what uh, is occurring in my neighborhood today. So that gets back to the practical solutions issue of can we define the problem? Can we define our approaches in in actual knowns and focus on that and you know maybe we we really we think we're going to need a more built solution in five or ten years but why don't we wait and see what the actual situation is on the ground before we make sixty million dollar investments if we think we can make a difference today in uh, what's going on with minor improvements start there and wait until you see the need for sixty million dollar uh, investments before you do it. Now, this is an example of where the feds can be quite difficult and you have to push really hard, but some states are starting to do it and uh, I think Federal Highways is, uh, you know, when pushed properly, they're starting to loosen a lot of these rules. I mean, you just, uh, if you were paying attention earlier this year, they changed a lot of the the design controls for federal investment roadways um, and took a lot of, of uh, requirements off. Um, and with those controls gone, it makes uh, the, the whole program a lot more open, uh, a lot more affordable, and they're looking for other ways to, to adjust. So I think the extent to which folks are pushing on them, that's how they're determining what new regulatory guidance changes procedural changes they need to do next. Thanks. Um, let's talk about the future of transportation. Oh, wow. how, how is how's DOT looking uh, at, at future advances? And I guess we should probably go ahead and uh, talk about the big buzz topic lately autonomous of autonomous vehicles. <laughs> Because that seems no matter what we talk about on these Friday I'm webcasts, some vehicles. last last week we talked about goats and autonomous vehicles were sure to come up. <laughs> <laughs> so this one's a little easier to segue into. <laughs> yeah, he's a little more on point, and and it's a really interesting issue. Um, really, for the last thirty years, we've needed to update all of our transportation models, and I, I mean. I don't even like to call most of them models. Almost no state, I think, except for Oregon, has a statewide model. It's really just a Excel spreadsheet that is designed to come up with a projection. It's not, it's not good enough to be called a model. Um, so we've needed to update these, you know, our approaches for a long time. Now you add in, I mean, let's not even get to autonomous vehicles. Let's talk about shared use mobility and what that does to the system. I mean, it, it, that is really shaking things up, and we haven't even gotten to autonomous vehicles yet. Um, and we don't. We are already have in most cities a really robust uh, competition on shared use mobility, and we are don't you, have any idea how to. Are, are you referring that. to like the Ubers and the Lyfts and things Lyft, like that? Uh, bridge and okay. yeah, all of those. A any bit of technology that allows you to share a ride um, and 
they're really important and they've shifted travel demand and they've opened up. In some cases, uh, we're seeing them compete with underutilized transit lines and other places we see them uh, creating demand for transit because people are taking uh, you know, these shared rides to uh, transit. So it's kind of expanding the, uh, the field that it can serve. There's all kinds of things going on. We don't have any idea how to factor what's going on today into our models, much less how to project for what altern uh, 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 autonomous vehicles will do our, to our system when they come online, which we're not even sure when's going to happen. So yeah, we're in a, a highly disruptive time, and it is absolutely fascinating. Um, my, my organization is working with Sidewalk Labs, uh, a Google spinoff uh, that do, has access to a lot of data and technology. Um, we are working with 17 cities on um, you know, various ideas that they've had to create more connected communities and use technology to connect people to transportation choices. And some of them want to look at autonomous vehicles as well. And yeah, there's a lot of questions. How do you design a roadway for an autonomous vehicle? Um, we could go Robert Moses style and say, well, the safest thing is to get rid of all the buildings on the side of the road, have nice clear zones there, and then if there's any problem, well, you've got the clear zone, and get rid of all the people, because that's going to really mess up the vehicles. That would be a nice, simple roadway. And what I think is going to be important is to make very clear as uh, the infrastructure for autonomous vehicles is being set out, to make sure we make clear that they're most likely to be utilized in areas where people live and work and play, and so you can't clear out the people in the buildings that we go to where we live, work, and play. And, uh, and even thinking about this beyond the technology of the vehicle and what its impact is on the community around it uh, is going to be important. Frankly, it's something we did not do in the highway era. We waited until the damage was done before we really started trying to, to, to control for it. Um, and we can't afford to do that here. I think the other big thing is how do we make sure that this is utilized in a way that benefits all segments of the population um, rather than just uh, uh, you know those who can afford their own fancy autonomous vehicle. Um, I'm not a millennial. I'm a, a Gen Xer, the generation that was in charge for about a week and a half in 2014 and then was supplanted by the millennials. and um, uh, but even I am completely saddled with college debt, much like most millennials are. And the reason I moved into the city when I moved to Washington, D.C., was because what disposable income I had for a car was going to student loans. And it was not an option to me to buy a car because you can't get out of student loans. You can't even get out of a student loan with bankruptcy. So I had to take what normal people use for cars and put it in my student loan. So I moved into an area where I didn't need a car because that was the only choice available to me. And that is the life of most millennials. And you know, so we have saddled them with such student debt that the notion of having your own fancy autonomous vehicle or any vehicle at all is not available to most of them. And they're looking for ways to utilize this infrastructure in a way that adds to their uh, mobility, but doesn't add to their ownership burden because they already have. They start off life with a debt burden, and figuring out ways for that to be the case is going to be the responsibility of thought leaders and cities to put these in the fleets and ensure that they, like I said, that they're available to those whether they are going to own them directly or not. And that is going to be tricky. And then figuring out how to judge where fleets of autonomous vehicles might be a good alternative to transit where there's not enough density or there's not enough ridership for the transit, but then make sure that we have transit in the corridors where that, uh, where that makes the most sense. Um, maybe it, we can do this in a way that, um, uh, that is much better for everyone, but these are big questions and will require some much better tools, much better understanding and surveying of what's going on now, and frankly, checking back to see whether or not the, the projections we make about travel turn out to be true, which is something we don't do. We rarely say, I'm building this road, I think the traffic will be X, and then come back in 10 years and see if we were right. We only come back and check it when we can tell something's broken down 
and we're looking to build that next project. We're going to need to build in that feedback loop because it's going to be 20 years before we understand how to factor for these things. And one more point is when we design our roadways, um, you know, we don't know if there's going to be a bounce in the short run, or the short run uh, in VMT because there's access to more of these uh, sorts of methods of mobility or a, a downturn or what, but trying to figure out what's going on over the long run is going to be important rather than looking at short dips and short bounces because this is where we get ourselves in trouble. We see a minor tick up, we project that it's going to go up at exactly that angle for the next 20 years, and we start building on that the basis of that need that almost almost never comes to be, throwing money that we don't have after a problem we don't know will exist. And we can't let AVs be our next excuse for doing what we've done wrong for at least 30 years. OK, thanks. Um, I, I told you during our training that I wouldn't give you any curveballs, but this one's really good, so I have to. <laughs> um, what effects could possibly happen for transportation planning from the election coming up in the next 11 days? Oh, I don't even know if that's a curveball, really. I think that's okay. a, if we're not thinking about this election right now, then I don't know what we're doing. This is a pretty <laughs> big deal. Um, and it's, it's really hard to know. What I will tell you are a bunch of different, you know, rumors going around town, and uh, <laughs> I will just, I will label them as such. Um, you know, both uh, of our presidential candidates have talked about greater investment in infrastructure, particularly transportation infrastructure. Neither have done a very good job of explaining how they will pay for it. Um, it both proposals really rely very heavily on loans and finance, which is not money. It is giving you a loan for you to then come up with the money to pay back. And uh, that does not solve funding problems. Um, so there's a lot of interest on Capitol Hill in taking up an infrastructure package in the new year. The reasons for that are everyone knows that the problem with addressing transportation needs and funding was not truly taken care of in the FAST Act. Um, they got something done, they gave stability, but they know that they punted yet again third time and that we need to revisit it. Another reason is there's still a sense that transportation is overwhelmingly bipartisan and considering how ugly things have been at all levels of government in this hyper-partisan environment, wouldn't it be fun to take up an issue everyone wants to fund, everyone wants to talk about? Um, there's also a sense that the economy has you know, not roared to life like people want it to and, and a big new investment in um, infrastructure building would help with that. Um, so those are the reasons I think people are talking about it. Um, and there's a particular sense if Hillary Clinton were to win and the Democrats were to take the Senate that there would be a focus in her first 100 days on an infrastructure package. That all sounds lovely. Now let me tell you why I think it's not true. <laughs> um, and very few people agree with me on this. So I will tell you, if you talk to most people in DC, they're truly uh, you know, true believers that this is, this is all the case. Um, one reason I, th I think it's a problem is the FAST Act was just passed and there's four more years of program before we need to do anything on transportation. And considering the fact that even when we have been facing major cliffs and disasters, we didn't act then, um, I don't see, I mean, we, we've shut down the program rather than act in a couple of cases. Why they think that we would put a ton of money in the program when there's no need to, to address it, I don't get. Secondly, um, I think uh, it's going to take either a gas tax increase or some major corporate tax overhaul to get uh, funding for transportation on the table. And I don't really, there's no way 
either Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton come in and their first order of, uh, of action is to say, I'm raising everybody's gas tax. That's not happening. Um, and in fact, if we push them to take a stand on the gas tax in their first 100 days, they will take it off the table just like Barack Obama did and you'll we'll lose four to eight years in talking about it. Um, I think uh, corporate tax restructuring, if there's a Donald Trump presidency, would be more likely to come up um, than if Hillary Clinton does because I think that uh, her left flank will never forgive her if the first thing she does is corporate tax relief. So I there's all kinds of people spinning tales about these great things that are going to happen on infrastructure. I just don't really see it. I, I think we're looking at, um, at, for the most part, waiting until the FAST Act is done before we do anything. And, and there will continue to be, to be action on the state and local level. And there are transportation ballot initiatives on ballots across the country right now from Indianapolis to Sacramento. And so watching what happens with those will be very, very interesting because they've traditionally been quite successful. But at the federal level, I struggle to believe that it will be taken up. The one exception I will give is I wouldn't be stunned if someone were to offer a bill that focuses particularly on what we refer to as smart cities now. Um, though I like to call it connected communities because um, there are very different but very important important issues for transportation connectedness in rural areas and automated vehicles and things like that that apply to rural areas, but it's just a very different slate of issues than we find in urban areas, and both are equally important. And so I wouldn't be surprised if someone put together a package on that narrow issue and maybe got some action there. Okay. Um. I think we'll do one more question, and then we'll uh, end it for the day. Could you tell us a little more about the Washington State study of the costs of design and defend process? Uh, yeah, I, in fairness, I don't think I would call it a study. I think that they've looked over several projects where they got in big fights with communities. And they looked at how much they had to add to those projects to get them done with, you know, get rid of lawsuits and, and deal with really angry local stakeholders. And they, they found, and there's an actual number they've attached to it that one of their um, senior executives shared with me on a panel, I want to say at National APA, in fact. Um, but I don't remember what it, I just remember that it was in the, the millions, uh, someplace around $5 million or something like that. So th what they did, as I understand, is they took a, a bunch of projects that had become highly controversial and look at what had to be added on to basically buy off the opposition. And they discovered it was expensive, and that's not the right way to do things. And maybe they should go in from the beginning and ask people what they want and consider this stuff early. And where they have done that, they found that they've been able to keep costs under control. Okay. Well, I think we're going to go ahead and um, wrap up for the afternoon. So, Beth Osborne, um, thanks for joining us today, and thanks to the thanks Transportation Planning Division for hosting today's webcast. And um, I would be remiss if I didn't say go tribe, because uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's our turn. <laughs> so, everyone, um, have a great weekend, and um, we'll... Talk to everyone next time. Thank you.